From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. As wildfire season approaches, what are we in for? We break down what you need to know to prepare for the worst. And I'm tracking the rain totals we've seen in the state so far this year and the risk for a drought here in the valley. Plus, a new app to alert you when a wildfire sparks so you can keep you and your family safe. And the latest on the looming border shutdown and how it could impact the Arizona economy. Cronkite News starts now. Good evening and welcome to Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Haley Brandt. And I'm Bayan Wang. Thank you for joining us. Our big story tonight, wildfire warning. Experts say this fire season could be extra explosive thanks to the wetter than usual winter. So what can we do now to ensure our safety when the fires begin to spark? We've got the team coverage headed your way to answer that question. But first, here's why fire officials are so concerned. A spokesman for the Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management says Arizona's wet and snowy winter has created prime wildfire conditions. Obviously, the, 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 the fuels did absorb a lot of that moisture, but if we do get a, a drier, a little bit warmer spring, it could dry out and we could become critical again. This winter was the sixth wettest on record in Phoenix with heavy snow in the high country, helping to ease a long drought. Governor Doug Ducey says the fire outlook is good news in the short term. Wet winters can mean very dangerous summers. That's because more precipitation brings more fuel vegetation, which increases fire danger. So our plea to everyone this fire season is to remain vigilant. Fire officials say the fire season could be on par with 2005. That's when lightning sparked a massive wildfire on the outskirts of Phoenix. But now in 2019, we have more options than ever to alert people once a wildfire breaks out to give them enough time to evacuate and seek shelter. The Arizona the Department of Forestry and Fire Management just released a new app that will let you know where wildfires are. Cronkite News reporter Peter Gong joins us live now to explain how the app works. Peter. That's right. The new app keeps you updated with what's happening with wildfires around Arizona. Take a look at what this app can do. You can tap on the location icon where you can get real-time information on fires that are near you. Right now, you'll see on the map a few fires. These are all prescribed burns. You can also report wildfires in the app by tapping the tips icon. It's, where, it's here where you can provide information about the fire and upload photos. Now, Arizona's Governor Doug Ducey wants people to get the app. I encourage everyone to download this app from iTunes or Google Play by searching for Department of Forestry and Fire Management. The app also allows you to get push notifications about wildfire alerts near you. Live in the Cronkite News Studio, I'm Peter Gon. Now let's send things over to Lauren Sheeler in our Cronkite News Weather Center with more on rainfall totals so far this year. Lauren, I know we had a lot of rain this winter, but how will this really affect our wildfire season? Well, we certainly experienced above average rain totals, which is actually great news for our reservoirs. In Phoenix so far this year, we've seen above four and a half inches of rain and usually takes us the whole year to get eight inches. And we still have monsoon ahead of us to deal with. In terms of Prescott, they've gotten over 13 inches, usually takes them the whole year to get 17. So while this is great news for our reservoirs, we are back to the dry heat. We're not tracking a whole lot on a radar. So despite above average rain totals, we're still facing a near 20 year droughts. We are certainly still at risk this season for wildfires. For Cronkite Weather, I'm Lauren Sheeler. Here in Arizona, wildfires are not a matter of if, but when. So what do you do if you need to evacuate this summer? The Arizona Department of Forestry and Fire Management suggests the ready, set, go plan when a wildfire strikes. Be ready by being aware of the hazards in your community and creating a plan with your family. And the get set, be alert to know when a wildfire does break out. And go, if your life is in danger, you should evacuate. And if you do need to evacuate, follow the five P's to prioritize. First, evacuate people and pets, then prescriptions or medicine you may need, followed by papers, including important documents like passports. Next comes personal needs like water, food, credit cards, and a first aid kit. And finally, priceless items like photos. 
And in order to protect your house, you should create a clear defensible space. This means you should trim your trees at least 10 feet away from the chimney or roof, space trees at least 10 feet apart from each other so it doesn't spread the fire, and do not store wood or pro propane tanks near your house. You could even get fire resistant plants that will help prevent wildfires from spreading. The forest in Flagstaff is riddled with trees marked to be cut down. As Nicole Hernandez reports, the trees are being removed in a unique way. Take a look. This is a normal day on the job for Dave Webb and his crew. I've been doing this with helicopters for about 20, 22 years. 16 crew members. We've got guys from all over the country. Traveling state to state with their logging equipment, their helicopter, and of course, the essentials. We're all pretty good friends, yep. Their current stop, Mount Eldon in Flagstaff, where they are cutting and flying trees to thin out the forest. Once the trees are cut down and helicoptered off of the mountain, the loggers take them and put them into large decks like behind me. They're taller than me and they actually extend the entire length of this road. And this is just one of many decks that the loggers have put together. This is a really important project. It's really a fuels reduction project, trying to eliminate the threat of catastrophic fire and flooding. Before this thinning, the trees were growing so closely together that it became a fire hazard. A lot of times people's vision of a forest is just a really dense stand of trees, which actually in this area is not uh, true natural conditions for the forest. Beyond wildfire protection, the thinning is also keeping Flagstaff drinking water clean. If there was a fire and um, a lot of sediment got in the water, uh, it really would be unusable for drinking water. It's all these reasons and more why Flagstaff officials worked to make this labor intensive and expensive project happen. Per, per hour, it's thousands of dollars. So we have to keep the, we got to keep things moving. While staying safe, because logging is extremely dangerous. Did you want to sneak up here a little closer, Pat? But it's nothing new for the loggers. This is all normal for us, yeah. <laughs> this is, this is every day, what happens every day. <laughs> On Mount Eldon, Cole Hernandez, Cronkite News. The thinning process is costing millions of dollars, part of which is coming from taxpayer pockets. The helicopter is phase two of the overall project and is expected to be completed mid-May. Cronkite News is dedicated to covering environmental stories from how Arizonans are adapting to climate change to planning for growth and more. So what questions do you have about Arizonans' environmental future? Text EARTH to 602-536-9815 to share your questions and our team will help answer them. Again, that's EARTH to 602-536-9815. Coming up next on Cronkite News, Arizona is one of four states where consumers don't pay tax to online retailers, but some leaders say that's not fair, and now they're pushing for a bill to change that. Plus, we have the latest on the border wall crisis, how, residents, how President Trump's plan to shut down the border could impact our economy. Stay in the know, on the go. At Cronkite News, we work hard to report the facts and keep you updated, whether we're on set or on the scene. Taking it from the studio to the field. So I'm here in South Phoenix. In Phoenix, we're just a click away. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter, or find us online at cronkitenews.azpbs.org. I'm Judy Woodruff, anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour. The journalists of tomorrow face a fast-changing media landscape, but quality news remains vitally important to our communities, our country, and our world. At ASU's Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication, students learn solid, reliable reporting, holding the powerful accountable, and rebuilding the public's trust. The Cronkite School and Arizona PBS preparing the next generation for a stronger future of journalism. Millions of people die every year from drinking dirty water. I would never have felt I had the ability to do something without ASU pushing me. We built filtration systems out of local materials with the people. To see those kids drink clean water for the first time, it's the most rewarding feeling that you can ever have. I went to ASU because I wanted to change the world. 
The thing I never would have expected is how the world would have changed me. President Donald Trump has threatened to shut down the U.S.-Mexican border if Mexico doesn't immediately stop the flow of undocumented immigration. If the president were to close down the southern border, it would likely have major implications for Arizona. Cronkite News reporter John Cardinelli spoke with several local experts who break down the potential impact. John? The impact of a border shutdown would be felt across the board, affecting our state's political, social, and economic ties with Mexico. Massive caravans walking right through Mexico. So Mexico's tough. They can stop them, but they chose not to. Now they're going to stop them. And if they don't stop them, we're closing the border. President Trump has made it clear he's considering closing the southern U.S. border as a way to deal with what his administration calls a crisis surrounding the increased number of migrant families seeking asylum. The possibility of a border shutdown has local experts, like ASU professor Alexander Avina, studying what that could really look like. Borders also, the way it's set up, can also facilitate certain modes of, of, of transactions or interactions, right? Mostly limited to these trans-border cities, right? So if Trump was to cut off this interaction, it's going to hurt everyday people on a, uh, on a political, economic, and social level. And on a financial level as well. Okay. Millions of dollars would be at stake if the border is closed. It's an idea Governor Doug Ducey is not keen on. Well, of course I don't want to see the border close. I mean, I've said a thousand times or more, Mexico is our number one trading partner times four. So I want to see us continue to be able to trade. But the border does need attention. There is a crisis at the border. It's a humanitarian crisis, and Congress needs to act on this. Presuming that it's a long shutdown, uh, this is a very big deal for Arizona. Uh, Air Mexico is Arizona's largest trading partner by, like, a factor of four. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not close. Uh, it's $15 billion of trade. Uh, it's everything from auto parts to agricultural produce. Aside from the financial impact, Avina says closing down the border with Mexico could have serious consequences on the relationship with our neighbor to the south. Socially and politically, this sends a terrible message to Mexico. Right? The U.S. needs to have a cordial working relationship with the Mexican government. And actually, the current Mexican government, even though it presents itself as being more progressive or leftist, they have been really patient with the Trump administration. They have tried to not engage in the name calling and the fighting um, because they recognize that this is a really important relationship that they cannot afford to turn into a negative one. A border shutdown would effectively close all the ports of entry, not allowing anyone to cross by car, bus, or on foot heading north or south. This, of course, wouldn't include the expansive areas in between cross points, potentially rerouting the flow of migrants towards much more treacherous terrains. In the Broadcast Center, John Cardinelli, Cronkite News. The Yavapai County Board of Supervisors will choose between a former state lawmaker, a former Secretary of State, and a Republican activist to replace State Representative David Stringer, who is accused of paying teens for sex in the 1980s. The nominees are former Rep Steve Pierce, former Secretary of State and Senate President Ken Bennett, and a Republican organizer Stephen Sensmeyer. The Arizona Capital Times reports Pierce is the front runner as he claims he would finish the two-year term but would not run for the seat after. April is World Autism Awareness Month, and today is World Autism Awareness Day. Last year, about every one in 59 children were diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. That accounts for one in 37 boys and one in 151 girls. There is no medical detection for autism, but for parents, paying attention to developmental milestones is key. Core symptoms of autism are repetitive behaviors and challenges with communication. The next shirt you buy on eBay or Etsy could be taxed to keep money in Arizona. Alexis Pulick is standing by to explain how lawmakers are trying to enforce a tax for online purchases from out-of-state retailers. Alexis? House Bill 2702 could change the online shopping experience for consumers in Arizona. As a result of a case in South Dakota against Wayfair Furniture Retailer, online purchases could be taxed. Consumers shopping on eBay do not pay a sales tax because those online retailers don't have a brick and mortar building in the state. Advocacy group Arizona Local First says that's not fair. 
when laws like this are not enforced for all the businesses that sell the same types of goods, uh, then uh, it's, it's, it's bad for business in Arizona because that keeps less taxes in Arizona. A state statute requires consumers to pay taxes on their purchased goods from sites like Etsy, but most shoppers don't know about the use tax. You as a buyer, as a, as a consumer, when you purchase these goods, you are supposed to, at the end of the year, make an estimated payment and pay what's called the use tax. Now, practically, let's just be honest, virtually nobody does it. Lawmaker Ben Toma is sponsoring House Bill 2702. The bill would apply to retailers that don't have a physical presence in Arizona. Marketplaces like Amazon have warehouses in the state, but third-party sellers do not have to charge a sales tax. There was a case, um, South Dakota versus Wayfair where the state of South Dakota had passed a law essentially saying that all out-of-state sellers that do over a certain amount of business into the state, the, the limits that they have were 200 transactions or $100,000 worth of, of sales into the state, would have to pay a, uh, would have to pay the sales tax. McCarthy of the Arizona Tax Research Association says the bill won't work because our state tax system is not ready to support the change. Our biggest flaw at this point is, is we have what's called an independent municipal sales tax system. The cities in Arizona have their own sales tax bases. Uh, there are 93 different cities with different ways of taxing. One goal of this bill is to even the playing field for Arizona businesses. If you have a small retail shop and you're selling items like vacuums or record players or things like that, and you have to remit and collect sales taxes for somebody that walks into your store, but that same individual could go to an online company and buy that same product but not have to pay sales taxes, there's a very uncompetitive advantage for the small business that's trying to keep its doors open. It's unclear if the bill will be approved. Barr says if it is not, businesses will have to continue to compete with internet giants. Alexis Pulik, Cronkite News. Up next on Cronkite News, the Alliance of American Football has suspended future league operations. And this is only after eight weeks of games in its first season. Our Cronkite sports team has a story after the break. By the year 2050, there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. Before Professor Halden, I had an insane amount of passion, but I almost felt helpless because I didn't know how to use it. Professor Halden gave me a chance to make a difference. Being at a place like ASU allows you to take these big leaps. Ultimately, the biggest problems in the world cannot be solved alone. The Arizona Hotshots and the league in which they, they play may not be operating for much longer. As Cronkite News reporter Blaine McCormick explains, the league was running into trouble before, but is now in danger of folding. That's right, Haley. Reports from Action Network's Darren Ravel said that the Alliance of American Football is suspending football operations effective today. The Spring Football League hoped to make an arrangement with the NFL Players Association with the goal of becoming a de facto developmental league for the NFL. But news broke last week that a potential partnership might not happen. And as a result, the league's chairman, Tom Dundon, might shut the league down. Cronkite News spoke to Arizona Hot Shots coach Rick Neuheisel after those initial ports surfaced. I know this. There's plenty of good players. There's plenty of good coaches, and we're having a blast. And uh, so I got my fingers crossed that this opportunity will be available to players in the future. But that future may never come for the Hot Shots and the seven other teams that make up the Alliance of American Football. Dundon, who also owns the National Hockey League's Carolina Hurricanes, pledged $250 million in February to the AAF to jumpstart the league, but threatened to fold it because he wanted the league to immediately have a minor league relationship with the NFL. 
AAF co-founder and Pro Football Hall of Famer Bill Polian expressed disappointment through a statement shared by Ravel on Twitter saying, quote, When Mr. Dundon took over, it was the belief of my co-founder, Charlie Ebersol and myself that we would finish the season, pay our creditors, and make the necessary adjustments to move forward in a manner that made economic sense for all. Scottsdale's Sneaky Big Studios produces game broadcast and studio shows for the league. They declined comment, as did representatives for the Hot Shots. The team was scheduled to play two more games before the end of the regular season. The ASU women's basketball team had made it to the Sweet 16 of the women's NCAA tournament this year. Reporter Eliav Gabay was in Portland to cover the game and the journey the Sun Devils had in the tournament. Really proud of our senior class this year for uh, stepping up and leading our team. Four unique players with four paths to their senior season in Tempe. Kiana Ivis and Sharnae Johnson Chapman came off the pine before becoming consistent starters, while transfers Sophia Alenga and Courtney Eckmark seamlessly found their roles in Charlie Turner Thorne's system in two years at Arizona State. I'm just so proud of this team. I'm so grateful uh, for these seniors to, to have they had the opportunity to coach them and the legacy that they're going to leave with um, just who they are as people, you know, and, and how hard they work and everything that they do. While their on-court careers at ASU ended in the Sweet 16, this senior class legacy goes beyond the hardwood. Who we are as athletes and who we are as people um, on and off the court and also just continuing um, Charlie's culture and ASU culture. They live to the standards of our program on and off the court and we have very high standards. We have very high standards that they are getting A's and B's and they're you know they're great citizens and they're doing their community service and you know they're just doing work you know and making great decisions with their life. <laughs> Ibis and Johnson Chapman, who each earned Pac-12 All-Academic Honorable Mentions the last three seasons, will graduate in May. Alenga, majoring in sports journalism, and Eckmark, working towards a law degree, have one more year of studies. The example they've set has inspired the next group of seniors. I loved playing with them, and they did a lot for our team, and um, they're just paving the way for the future. They uh, have done an amazing job, you know, showing our younger players what it means to be a Sun Devil. In Tempe, Eliav, goodbye. Focus. Cronkite News. That's a sad end to the season, but the ASU team did great this year. For Cronkite Sports, I'm Blaine McCormick. Well, soon it's going to be too hot to play any sports or anything outside for that matter outside here in Arizona. Lauren, how much longer can we expect this beautiful weather before we get into the triple digits? Well, we do not even want to be thinking about triple digit temperatures, but we're being set up to experiencing just that not too far off. Radar is pretty quiet. High pressure has persistently returned to the state, so we're seeing low humidity. And in fact, if it was this time last year, we would only be eight days out from hitting 100 degrees. They hit it April 10th last year, but there's some hope they held off until the first week of May the year prior. And we're going to see a warm up that we'll get to in the seven day in just a second. But until then, we're going to cling on to those spring temperatures, beautiful, perfect pool like temperature. The 70s still in the valley golfing. Perhaps if you get the chance, perfect time to take a trip up north 50s in Flagstaff. Same goes to the Grand Canyon. Otherwise, the hot spot being the 80s out west. And tonight we're going to stay dry. If you're taking the dog out, we should only drop into the mid 70s for tonight and then nothing but sunshine for the next couple of days. Lows in the 50s bouncing in the highs between upper 70s and mid 80s. But this is where you might cringe if you can bear to take a look at it. For Monday and Tuesday, temperatures spiking into the upper to mid 90s. Potential for that first 100 degree day as early as next week. For Cronkite Weather, I'm Lauren Sheeler. After the break, the Phoenix Zoo welcomes another member into their family. We'll have the big reveal when we come back. I'm so excited. As journalists at Cronkite News, we report on stories that matter to you by focusing on the local impact. We dig deeper and work tirelessly to keep you informed. Live in Wickerburg. Live in Los Angeles. In Cleveland. In Washington. In Louisville. From Jerusalem. Live in Philadelphia. From around the world to right here in Phoenix. At Cronkite News, we report the facts and stick to the truth. If you're looking for one show that tells you what happened that day in the world of business, 
It's NBR. We saw a classic chip wreck. Nordstrom's opening stores. Triple digit gains. Crude climbs. We're there to help our audience find new investment ideas. The market still has room to go up. Nightly Business Report is the longest running business television program in history. Weeknights at 1030 on Arizona PBS. On the next Arizona Horizon, an award-winning Grand Canyon photographer for Arizona Highways talks about her work. And another segment from our new Arizona PBS show celebrating Grand Canyon National Park's 100th birthday. I'm John Yang. On the next News Hour, a program to help young, low-income children learn to read sets up shop in a unique urban space, laundromats. That's Tuesday on the PBS News Hour. Finally tonight, it was no April's Fool's joke when the Phoenix Zoo announced yesterday that they have a brand new baby giraffe. And it's a girl. The nearly six foot tall baby giraffe was actually born on March 22nd and has been bonding with her mom, Sunshine, in the zoo's giraffe barn out of public sight. The zoo says she doesn't have a name yet and will join her two sisters, Siku and Rafiki, in the zoo's public savanna exhibit when she's ready. Isn't she adorable? That's oh so she's precious. She's so cute. Oh my gosh. But she's so tall. I can't believe that. That giraffe, as a baby, is taller than me right now. It's <laughs> taller than all of us. So don't worry about that. <laughs> well, of course, we wish Sunshine and her new baby the best of luck. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thanks for joining us. For the top Arizona stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org. Wow, that's so cute.